Well, good morning, everyone. How are we? Good. Are you ready? Yeah? <laughs> it's good to see you all back again. I didn't scare those of you who are here anyway. Maybe there are some that thought, oh boy, we'll just, uh, you know, either stay at home and take a break, and that's okay if that's you. Um, but I'm really glad to see each of your faces this morning. Um, today is exciting for me because while yesterday is great in terms of the information, that's just the hard work that you have to go through, right? Um, this morning, what we're turning to is the text in Romans and how we see that actually impacting our lives, right? Today, here, as believers in Jesus Christ. What does that mean for us today? What does any of this mean for us today? So we still have more um, hard work to do to begin or continue fleshing out these terms and these words and how they get used throughout the text, what was going through Paul's mind when he was writing these very influential, very key verses in Romans. So we'll keep doing that hard work, but um, we'll begin yeah, drawing some conclusions and thinking, what does this mean for, for me as a Christian? So let's do the first slide and just remind ourselves what we did yesterday. So here are our conclusions from last night. We were created in the image of God and given dominion. And the question that was raised, um, whether it was Roger's question or somebody else, about what does that look like to have dominion, especially with the created order, was an excellent question because we can't just assume dominion means exerting all power to the benefit of ourselves, right? In fact, where we'll go in the second lecture, the second half of this morning, is questioning more fully what does it look like to have dominion. The psalmist described that as being crowned with glory and honor as they commented on that Genesis 1 text. Glory for God, right, just for God himself, throughout the Old Testament referred to many things. It was a title for God. It referred to um, God's theophanic presence, right, inhabiting the, the temple space or lightning and thunder, right, as he reveals himself in these great signs and symbols. And then it meant his character, his, his um, goodness. But what we're actually caring more about, because this is the part that we don't usually question as Christians, scholars don't question it, it's one thing to talk about the glory of God. We all in kind of intrinsically understand what that means. But what does it mean for us, for you and I, to have glory? Is it the same? So glory and glorification for humanity throughout the Old Testament did not mean all these other things, but only this sense of having power or authority to rule, a, a status of authority, a status of honor, right? When you're on that throne, you have a status. When you have a crown on your head, it symbolizes a status. And so the idea of glory for humanity throughout the Old Testament is about that status that humans are given by God to rule over creation. So that's what we did yesterday. Okay, so our next slide, we'll come back to these presuppositions. So we're going to start with this again because it is fundamental to you learning anything. You cannot learn something new unless you know what you already believe. Moreover, when we're talking about the gospel and what we think the gospel is, I'm going to say things today that you'll think, yeah, I get that, I understand that, that makes sense, I believe that, that's gospel, sure. But it will likely be very different than what your actual presupposition of the gospel is. So let's go back to these note cards. If you have yours from yesterday, great, look at it. Um, I want to take one minute today, and if you're new this morning, um, or if you don't have your note card, grab the one that's on your chair, um, a pen, pencil, if you, if you need one, maybe there's some around that we can distribute. So we're taking glory out of the equation because we've done that. We're going to come back to it, of course. But today, we're going to focus more on this sense of salvation and gospel. So just take a minute or two and either ref revise or um, 
adapt your one from yesterday. What is the goal of salvation and what is the gospel? And if you didn't, you don't have it or you, you didn't do it with us yesterday, then take a moment and just write the key words or phrases. If you're a very fast thinker and writer, you could do a whole sentence. Um, what's the goal of salvation? Why did God save you? Why did God redeem you? What's the purpose? What's the goal? And what's the gospel? You have dedicated your life to believing this thing that we call the gospel. What is that? And as an extra for this morning, what proof texts do you use? Because we all have a starting point of understanding or at least articulating what the gospel might be for us with a place in the Bible. You have a verse that you know in your head that launches this idea for you of what the gospel is. It's your proof text. And it will be different for everyone, likely. Because how you define the gospel determines how you understand the goal of salvation. So just take a minute. Think to yourself. Write down... Thirty more seconds. <laughs> Is this a hard exercise to do? Can I ask a little friendly engagement here? Why is it so hard? Why is this a difficult task? Yeah. So we, for me, we track the question by extreme and reason. Okay. Good, yeah. I'm going to bank on that first one, the first part of what you just responded with, and say we assume we know the answer to these until we actually have to put pen to paper. Yeah? Would that be something that you'd all say, yep, I'm experiencing that? We know we understand something and can articulate it when we can actually write it out. And you know that you know something well and can articulate it well when you can write it out in one sentence in a short time frame. I'm going to give you a challenge and say this is, at least in theory, every, what every aspect of your life is about. If you have dedicated your life to belief in Jesus Christ as Lord, to the gospel message that we read about in the Bible, the way you spend your time, the way you spend your money, the relationships that you have, the goals that you have, how you raised your families, every aspect of your life was lived as a result of the gospel, and yet we find it difficult to even say in a short period of time what we actually think that gospel is. So my challenge to you going forward after all of this, we're going to come back around, is to figure that out for yourself so that you have that answer to be able to say, I live my life this way because X is the case. 
short and sweet, whatever that X is that changed the world and therefore changed your life. And especially as we think about salvation, If you want to know why God saved you, you have to know what specifically it was that God was doing on that cross. They're all connected. These theological questions are all connected. And what proof texts you use, well, that's just up to you. I was in um, Palestine last month, Israel and Palestine, leading a study abroad Whitworth trip. And so for three weeks, I had 16 students in Israel and Palestine, we spent you know, a week, for, I'm guessing some of you have been there before, um, we spent a week up in the Galilee touring those sites, having some red ladder days where we went to the, the locations where Jesus ministered. Um, spent four days hiking through the Northern West Bank, if you're watching the news and keeping up with it currently, there's major tensions there now. We hiked through those villages um, just before um, the, the tensions erupted in the way that they are now. A week in Jerusalem and then a week or so or half three quarters of a week in the Bethlehem area living in the homes of both Palestinian Muslims and Palestinian Christians. During that time, I had my students meet with a man named Mitri Raheb, Dr. Raheb. He's a Palestinian theologian um, and a president of a university in Bethlehem. And we were chatting about how the world interprets the Bible for either being pro-Israel or pro-Palestine. And one of the comments that he made was, the Bible is like the marketplace here in Bethlehem. You can go there and you can find everything you need and you can find nothing that you need. Which many of you have been to markets like this, you understand the analogy. When we look at the Bible and we are looking for evidence of something to support our ideas, you can find it. You can find it, and then some. And it's very easy also to take particular verses and twist them so that they become the evidence that you were looking for. And this is what he was getting at in terms of this market analogy. So you all have the text that you go to as the foundation for your understanding of what the gospel is, what it means the most. One real quick um, thing before we continue on with gospel, can you throw out some words? What's a key word that you use that's important to your understanding of the gospel? Faith, Faith? okay. Goodness, good, good news, yes. Good news of Christ, right. The euangelion, the good news, the gospel. Okay, good. What's so good about it? That'd be the follow-up question. Okay, this is good news. What's it good news about? And what makes it good? What else, what else came to mind? Okay, for everybody, good. What is it? Inclusive, Inclusive. absolutely. Life-changing. Life-changing, okay, good. I heard a, a hope. Okay, good. Trust. Trust. Did any, what's that? Love. Love, absolutely. Okay, good. Guide. Guide, okay. Did anybody have the word forgiveness? Yeah? Raise your hand if you had the word forgiveness. Wow. Okay. Did anybody have the word sin or sinful or sinner? Not a single one in the room included. Okay. Here, we learn a lot, right? How many did have love? We had a couple. Okay, good. How many had the word heaven? Okay, very curious. I would love to read all of yours. Um, We won't take the time for it. But here's what most people on the street are going to answer if you're just to go out downtown Kansas City and say, hey, are you a Christian? Um, Can you tell me what makes you, what, what do you believe? What's the gospel all about? What's the whole point? Why did Jesus die? Most people are going to refer to sin. Humans are sinful, and we needed to be punished. And Jesus died on the cross to take the punishment for our sins. In order that, what? What's that end result? Heaven. Heaven. So that we can be reconciled to God, forgiven of our sins, and go to heaven when we die. 
or many of you, I'm guessing, have gone through, through some form of um, evangelism training when you're taught to ask the questions like, hey, if you were to die tonight, today became the end of your life, do you know where you're going? Right? These types of questions that have been used historically for evangelism purposes. It's the question of, do you know what the end goal is and where you're headed? And the gospel then becomes the means by which we get to heaven, wherever that might be. For most people, it's out there seven, seven leagues past Pluto or something. Yeah. <laughs> the penthouse suite. <laughs> Maybe here in Kansas City. <laughs> But that's going to be your popular understanding within Christianity. Okay, so here's where, uh, or, or just to say also, as we talk about Romans, how many of you are familiar with the Romans Road? Anybody heard that phrase? Okay, some of you, I'm getting some head nods. The Romans Road is this. It's a series of proof text, cherry-picked verses in Romans that are said to essentially tell the story of the gospel or how we, quote, get saved. And it would begin with Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Right? So we establish that we're all sinful. Romans 6.23. For God demonstrates, uh, no, but the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, Romans 5, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Finished with Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, then you are saved. So you establish, I'm a sinner. God loved me and demonstrated that love by putting Jesus on the cross to forgive me of my sins so that I don't have to pay that debt. He paid it for me. And if I make this profession of faith and somehow ask him into my heart, that kind of Christianese language that we use, we ask Jesus into our heart, then I will, quote, be saved, which for us simply means going to heaven. Does that sound familiar to you for what you've heard historically in your earlier years or more recently? That's what's common out there. And the answer to what God was doing on the cross for that version of the gospel is he was paying the punishment for our sins in order that, and here's the goal of that salvation, in order that we would be found with him in heaven someday in glory. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Here's my version. This is my version of the gospel. God has returned to dwell with his people in the person of Jesus. So full stop, that's the entire Old Testament right there. God has returned to dwell with his people because in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, God dwelled with his people. There was no separation. There was goodness, shalom, justice, righteousness. But most importantly, God and his people dwelled together. And then exile from the garden. God dwells in the tabernacle. God dwelled in the temple. God dwelled not in the temple. At the end of the Old Testament, they had rebuilt the temple, but God had not returned, right? And so the Old Testament ended with Malachi expressing this hope, this confidence that one day God would return to dwell in the midst of his people. And so, here's the Old Testament. God has returned to dwell with his people, and he did so in the person of Jesus, right? That's what John 1.14 is so important. And the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, dwelt among us. God, Yahweh, the creator God, took on flesh and lived in our midst. That's how God of the Old Testament decided to return to dwell with his people. He did so through Jesus, who is um, the Lord and Messiah, right? He is Lord, he is ruler, he is God over all things, and he is the Jewish Messiah, the long-awaited king who would come and redeem Israel. 
specifically, but also for the world, through whose life, death, and resurrection, God launched the kingdom of God. That's the Gospels, bringing about redemption and reconciliation to all things. Not all people, but all things. Included in that is the idea, you need redemption because sin exists. You need redemption because evil exists. Systems need redemption because systems are broken. Right? What did we say last night? When did racism begin? Genesis 3. When did misogyny begin? Genesis 3. Hatred, murder, war, famine. Everything that is broken in God's originally good created order was launched in Genesis 3. And it's because of Genesis 3 that all things need redemption and reconciliation. And for me, my understanding of what God was doing on the cross, it has to include all those things. And if it doesn't include all those things, then I think we are having a misreading of what Jesus was actually accomplishing on the cross. So here are my, um, so in other words then, our goal, because that is the gospel, my goal of salvation is our participation with God in that work of redemption. In other words, here's what I would say to you if you said, so why am I saved? To do the work that God's called you to do. You don't have the end goal of just floating around in heaven, shining like a light bulb, but rather God called you, God justified you in order that you would become the people through whom this work of redemption is accomplished. He doesn't need you, but he wants you. And that's why he's called you, okay? So that's what my answer would be. And here's why I say presuppositions are hard to change. You probably think, yep, I know that. That makes sense. I've heard that before. My pastors tell me that. We hear that every Sunday. Yep, great. And at the same time, we still walk away many do anyway, with those presuppositions that don't get actually changed. Because we say, yep, I believe that, I know that. It doesn't actually replace anything. Those presuppositions continue to carry us. So let's go to the next slide. Here are my proof texts. Not Romans, but Colossians. Colossians 1.20, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Here's one of the few places where Paul actually tells us what God was doing on the cross. To reconcile to himself all things whether things on earth or things in heaven, which is simply a way of saying literally everything that exists. He doesn't literally mean things up there and things down here. It's an expression to say everything that is in existence has been reconciled by making peace through his blood shed on the cross, okay? Colossians 2 then, he forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. Okay, that's the part that For any of you who have grown up in a Presbyterian context or a Reformed context in general or let's just say an Evangelical context in general, that's the part we know well. It's been hammered into us. We are wretched sinners deserving of death and God took that punishment on our behalf. 100% absolutely that is there and it is, hear me, part of the gospel but I don't think it's the entirety of the gospel. Because what comes next? He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Who are these powers and authorities? Maybe human leaders, human rulers, Pilate, 
Roman guards or centurions who literally put Jesus on the cross. Maybe Nero, who would be Roman ruler at the time of Paul writing this. Maybe. But far more likely, Paul's referring to evil powers that continue to wreak havoc of God's good created world. Which is why in Ephesians, right, a very similar text to Colossians, he's talking about spiritual warfare and how we need, we fight not flesh and blood, right, but we fight powers of darkness, powers of evil, and we put on that armor in order to fight against these evil powers that are trying to disrupt God's good created world. So, try to think of these things together. Jesus dies on the cross in order to do two main things, at least according to Paul in this one text. Deal with our sin and the judgment that we deserve and taking that away, but also, and here's the bigger issue for Paul, to deal with the evil powers that are at work in the world from the point of Genesis 3 onward that continue to bring God's good created order into disruption. How do we get back to a Genesis 1 where everything is good and humans rule over creation representing God in the way that they're meant to? We first have to deal with the evil that we are enslaved to and give our lives to and participate in the work of. And if we deal with that evil, and God did through Jesus on the cross, then redemption and reconciliation can come, and it can come through those who have experienced this forgiveness, this redemption from evil. Does that make sense? I just hit you with a lot, and we're just getting started. It's okay. So, let's go to the next one. Why are we redeemed? Why has God reconciled us? Why has God forgiven us? What's the goal of salvation? In order that we would be, and here's I'm bringing last night and what we've done today together, that we would be restored to full humanity, crowned with glory and honor, participating in God's work of redemption as his image bearers, doing what we were meant to do at creation. For me, when I read the text, what I see is God creating humanity in Genesis 1, in the image of God, giving them dominion over the good created world of God, called with the purpose of representing God to the world around us, as kings, but also serving as priests where we serve the world around us by interceding on behalf of it to God. That's what a priest does. The king works top down, the priest works bottom up, which is why Israel and God's people are called to be a kingdom of priests. We're going to come to that more this morning. That's what we were created to do, and because sin and death entered, we failed to do that job. We abdicated the throne. We said, no thank you, I don't want that crown. I want the crown that I give to myself. Human idolatry, we worship ourselves, we take care of ourselves. Whatever suits me gets me to where I want to go, that's what I'll do, right? We gave up that responsibility that God had given us, what it truly meant to be human. And so then, Jesus dies on the cross and paves a way for you and I to be restored back to that position. That position of being the image bearers of God. And this is why Colossians 8, 28, 29, and 30 is so important because when commentators read verse 8, 29, And they say being conformed to the image of the Son is the goal of salvation. And they say, won't it be nice that we'll be like Christ? We'll be like Jesus? And I say, yes, absolutely. But what does that mean? To be like Christ, to bear the image of Christ, is to go back to what it truly meant to be human. 
to be the ruler that God has given in his place to represent him to the world. Okay, does that kind of full cycle make a little bit of sense anyway? Enough to continue? Okay. That's what we were meant to do originally. We stopped doing it, and now because of our identity in Jesus Christ, the image bearer of God himself, right, the son of God, therefore the family of God, we now are brought back into this position whereby we are more fully human than we actually were before. Because now our truest identity is the identity of the true human, Jesus. The truest human that we've had since Adam pre-fall. Okay, so we'll come back to that thought. Okay, so let's keep going. So we're going to walk through what I see as the narrative of glory in Romans. So we're, gonna, we're taking this idea of being conformed to the image of the Son in 829 and thinking, what does this mean? Because that referred to essentially glorification. This is just a reminder from last night. Romans 8.29, For those God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he would be the firstborn among many children. For those whom God predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he glorified. So what happens essentially is we have Paul saying being conformed to the image of the Son means being glorified. So if we want to know what it means to be conformed to the image of the Son, we have to know what it means to be glorified. And that's where nobody knows. (laughs) So here's where we are. So I think we look at how Paul uses glory for humans throughout Romans, and that then gives us a sense of what he means when we get to 830. So the first time we see it, you're familiar with these texts, you've seen them before, but now we're putting them together, perhaps in a way that you haven't seen. So Romans 1.23, although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Paul is here referring to idolatry, maybe of the Jewish people, but probably more Gentiles, humanity at large. But of course, once you add looking like birds and animals and reptiles, we are instantly back at what text? Genesis 1. Yep. The context in which we're meant to rule over, or Psalm 8, and have dominion over the birds, the animals, the reptiles, the fish in the sea. What did we do instead of rule? Paul is saying we exchanged the glory of God. Now, we don't know if that means <clears throat> that it is a glory that we had and we gave up, or if it's the glory of God that somehow we said, nope, we don't want to worship that glory, we want to worship a different glory. So whether this text is referring to our glory or God's glory doesn't really matter in this case because it's about saying, no, thank you. We choose a different glory altogether. A glory that ultimately is about us, idolatrizing our own selves, okay? And then that thought continues in Romans 3.23, text we're all very familiar with. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I'm guessing you all have that verse memorized. Or you've heard it at a minimum. Can you tell me what it means to fall short of the glory of God? Oftentimes, people will say it's a sense of sinning, missing the mark, Um, We think of the, many of you maybe have heard of an image of like a a target or with a bullseye in the middle, right? And we shoot an arrow or shoot a gun and we, you know, don't quite hit that bullseye so we miss the mark. We fall short of the perfection or the, 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 the holiness of God. To fall short of the holiness of God because we are sinful creatures. That's typically how this is understood. What I think Paul is actually getting at is the idea that we have abdicated the throne, we've given up the glory that God has given to us to be able to rule, to lead, to do what we are meant to do back in the beginning. 
because if we don't use this word fall short of, if we take that away, because that's usually what screws people up, and we say lack, which is the way that this word is typically translated and easily can be translated right here. What if we translate this, for all have sinned and lack the glory of God? Does that somehow change in your mind how we're meant to be reading this? In other words, I'm going to suggest it's not so much about not meeting the holiness of God, but rather it's about what we have given up. We no longer have the glory that God has given to us in order to be and do what we were called to do. Because of Genesis 1, we chose a different glory. We chose a human-made glory, where we say, it's about me, It's about my life, it's about my wants, my desires. I worship myself on my throne. God, here's your crown back, I'll take my crown for myself. And of course, the crown that we were given originally, Psalm 8, that's not innate to us, that can only come from God himself. So now if we've given that crown back, we now lack that sense of glory, that authority that God has given to his people, his creation, to rule on his behalf. So a different way of thinking about it. Okay, then Romans 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, right? There's that same sense of Colossians. We have peace because Jesus brought it through the cross through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. What is the glory of God that we hope for? To the point that we would boast about it. Because honestly, I couldn't care less about the idea of being bright and shining someday, seven leagues past Pluto. That's not much of a hope for me as I look around at a broken and suffering world. And you know who else it's not much of a hope for? The person who's dying of cancer. Or who has a spouse who's dying of cancer. Or the spouse who's or the the parent whose child is suffering, or the person who's just lost their job, the woman caught in the sex slave trade, the child who's a slave worker in Indonesia, the people in Somalia wondering where their next piece of bread is going to come from. Do they really care about being bright and shining someday in the future? They care about their life now. What would these Roman Christians be thinking in the first century when Paul's writing this to real people suffering real persecution in Rome for their faith? We boast in the hope of the glory of God. We'll come back to this. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And then that takes us to where we are focusing. So Romans 8, 28, 29, and 30. Okay, 8, 28. We know that God works all things for good for those who love him, for those called according to his purposes. For those whom God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many children. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. So in the yellow there is where I'm trying to help you see the main points of the text. Those called according to his purposes, what are the purposes of calling? Which is the answer to our question. Why did he call us? Why did he justify us? Why did he save us? Why did he redeem us? What was the purpose? The purpose is to be conformed to the image of the Son. Well, what the heck does that mean? Oh, that means to be glorified. What the heck does that mean? The purpose for God redeeming me is that I would be glorified. And now here's where the rubber meets the road. Did God call me and purpose my redemption so that I can look forward to 
heaven someplace in the future out there when it's about me shining. Yes, I'm in the presence of God. I acknowledge that. And that will be a wonderful thing. Or did God purpose me to be glorified, meaning that he has called me with a purpose to do something with my life? Is the Christian life about somehow getting to heaven out there in the future when we die? Or is the Christian life about life? You've already been given eternal life. It's not something we have to think about in the future. You're in it. You have crossed that bridge. Your physical body will die. But you are already living eternal life. Because you already belong to God. You already have been given hope for the future. That's done. That's the guarantee of the Christian hope, the Christian life. So are we meant to focus on that thing that will come in the future that the Bible tells us very little about? Or are we called to focus on this life that we've been given and the task that we've been given for the purposes that God has given them to us? Right? Most Christians within our kind of popular world of Christianity have been so trained to think about the future that they forget that I have a purpose. The reason why I am saved, the reason why I am called, is for now for my life to be lived now in a particular way. Okay, so we're going to go through um, these fairly quickly so that we can flesh this out a little bit more. So let's go to the next slide. So we're going to begin with Romans 8.29. What does it mean to be conformed to the image of his son? When we're asking this question, the key words here is, of course, image. When you say image and Jesus is the image of God, we're taken back to Genesis 1. You just have to. That's where image language begins. And if you're talking about a human, especially the son of God, you have to go back to Genesis 1. So to be conformed to the image of the son we have to begin that question with Genesis, and that's what we did yesterday with that image language. Also then, Psalm 8, Jesus is that son of man. Psalm 8 is one of the most important texts for all New Testament writers because when the, the New Testament writers read Psalm 8, they read it not as humanity in general, but as Jesus. When the psalmist says, what is man that you are mindful of then, the son of man that you care for them, in the Hebrew and Greek of the Old Testament, it can be a singular. What is the son of man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. So Paul says Jesus is the son of man of Psalm 8. The writer of Hebrews says Jesus is the son of man of Psalm 8. Israel before that time read it as humanity, the New Testament writers read that person of Psalm 8, which is that commentary on Genesis 1, as Jesus himself. And of course, we know from Romans chapter 5, death came through the one man, life came through the one man. Right? Death came through Adam, life came through the new Adam. Jesus is understood by Paul to be the new Adam, the new humanity. He has redeemed humanity in himself. We are redeemed in him, in this firstborn. And this is where baptism comes in for Paul. We die, we go under that water, and we die to our old lives, our old selves. We come back up out of that water. We are raising to new life, but now with a new identity. We are now identified by Jesus Christ himself. Anyone know what the most important word for Paul is? Take a guess. Throw out a word that you think is important to Paul and his theology. Be brave. Come on, be brave. You can just use any word. <laughs> Trust? Cross, okay? Faith? Redemption? Good? 
Joy, image. I'm going to stop you because you'll never get it. But that's fun. The word is in. I kid you not. I encourage you the next time you get your Bible and I see Bible, not Bible, the next time you get your Bible, read some of Paul's letters and you will notice in after about every other word. In Christ Jesus, in the Lord Jesus, we're saved in Christ, in Christ all things, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. For Paul... When we are redeemed, when we are saved, we are being transferred from one allegiance to one kingdom and one ruler to another. And baptism is the symbolic means by which we make that transfer. We die, we go under the water, and we're saying no to our previous allegiances. Our participation in the work of brokenness, of evil, And we rise to new life in Christ so that those who are in Christ are a new creation, he says in Galatians, right? In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, male nor female, slave or free, right? In Christ, because when we rise to new life, we take on new identity, and that new identity is the identity of Jesus Christ himself, So what's true of him becomes true of you. Here's how we can say that we are redeemed or we are the children of God. Jesus is the son of God and I am in him. He is my identity. What's true of him is true of me. So if he's a child of God, I'm the child of God. If he is justified, I am justified. If he is a restored, new, perfect human, then that is the same for me. If he is living in this time period of eternity, then I am living in this time period of eternity. We'll see a couple texts for that also. Okay, so here's Romans 8, 29. Okay, so let's do the next one. Okay, then what about glorified? When? Notice that it's not we will be glorified. For those whom God predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he glorified. It's done. Are you justified? And you all say yes. Then you are glorified. What does that mean? Is it the something that's kind of out there in the future that we're waiting for someday when we reach that point? Maybe, yes, but at the same time, what Paul is saying here is we are glorified. And if we take him at his word that the identity of Jesus is the identity that we now have, and Jesus is that son of man of Psalm 8, which is to say that new Adam figure, that means then that we are that same person. We are restored to that sense of a truer humanity. We're back to what we were. We're back on the throne. We're back ruling, but not ruling with the crown that we put on our heads, right? We've taken that crown off. When we go into that water, we say no to that crown that we've previously had on our head. And we rise to new life with new allegiance to God and the kingdom of God, led by the Holy Spirit, saying, the crown that's on my head is the crown that God has given me to rule and represent him and his kingdom, which is what Adam was meant to do in the beginning, what Psalm 8 talks about, what Jesus did as the person of Psalm 8, and what we now do with Jesus as our identity. Yeah? Okay. We will reign. Here's a bunch of texts for you. 2 Timothy, if we endure, we will also reign with him. If he, we disown him, he will disown us. Revelation 5.10, you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. What I'm doing is showing you how this is throughout the Bible, this idea that the goal for us is to reign, to rule. 
Revelation 22, there will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. This is kingship language. It's not just they will be with God forever and ever. They have a task. They have a purpose. They have a job. They will reign forever and ever. Romans 5.17, for if by the trespass of the one man, Adam, right, death came or death reigned, death ruled through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man? Notice, it's not grace and righteousness that are reigning. It's those who have received this who do the reigning. That's you and I. How much more will they reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? So, Romans 8.29, to be like Christ is to be glorified in Christ. And if that means that Jesus is the Son of Man of Psalm 8, the new Adam of Genesis 1, reigning over, given dominion over, crowned with glory and honor over, right, ruling, we say Jesus is Lord. If that's what he is doing and he is our identity as a human, then that's what we are doing. Okay, now we're going to do Romans 8.28. Um, and this one, I give an apology in advance. I know that sounds weird. If for any of you, this is a verse that has been a life verse of sorts that you have held on to and clung to in the midst of hard times, and it's a verse that's given you hope and faith and the ability to endure, wonderful. I in no way want to take that away. But I do want to suggest that we have perhaps misused and mistranslated this verse. We know that God works all things for good for those who love him, for those called according to his purposes. Okay? You've heard of this one, I guess. Um, it's a verse that's often given during times of trauma, times of suffering. It's a verse that's used to reassure. Somehow, in the midst of this, God's working for good. Somehow, good will come out of this. Somehow, though we don't know how, there's got to be a good reason for this to be happening, okay? Typically, we ask the question, or scholars ask the question, if you were to read a commentary, this is what they're going to talk about. Who is doing the working? Is it God, or is it all things? Because you even probably know it different ways. You can easily translate this verse. We know that God works all things. We can also translate it, we know that in all things, God works. We also know it as all things work together without God in there. The reason for that is in the earliest manuscripts that we have, there are differences. And some include God in the text itself and others don't have the word God there and it would just be implied. So that's typically the question. I don't think that matters. Even if we say all things work together, we're still assuming it's by God's providence. Yeah, even if we don't name God, he's still clearly the one who is doing this good working. Let's go to the next slide. What I want to question is the working all things together. So typically, we refer to this verse, or we think about it as, okay, all things work together, or God works all things together for good. It's this notion that there are all these kind of bad things that are happening, and somehow, in the, in the season of time or history, I'm picturing it like this arrow, where all these things are here, and somehow, out of it, God is bringing something good, right? All things are kind of working together to produce something else. The issue with that, well, many things, but what I'm going to focus on is that's not how this word is used elsewhere and how it's translated. So this word is used five times in the New Testament. These are the other four times, this idea of working things together, work together. In Mark, 
The disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. God worked with them. So it's not the idea that God somehow worked all things in this manner, but rather it's the idea of a partnership. Two entities working together as a partnership. God worked with them for this to happen. Okay? James, you see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. You see that his faith and his actions were working together. 1 Corinthians 16, be subject to such as these, to every fellow worker and laborer. Every fellow worker, you and your fellow worker who works with you. Two things. 2 Corinthians, as God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. As the people who work with God, here's God, here's us, we are God's co-workers, we work together with him. In other words, in Romans 8, 28, it likely, or I don't think it should be anyway, this idea of God works all things for good. Somehow we've got these things and he's bringing them together and going to bring something good out of it. But rather, God works with two things. Two things together. For good. What kind of good? When? And what does this say about evil? This is actually one of the biggest issues I have with how we use this verse. When we say, I know life is horrible right now, we are suffering, I am suffering, or you are suffering, or this thing is happening, but don't worry, God will bring something good out of it. There's got to be a good reason for this to be happening. God's going to draw something good. All that that does, besides giving us some sort of hope, which yes is good, but what it does is it nullifies evil. It makes suffering or evil somehow be more palatable. If we can say, but good will come. We're not very good at just saying this is evil and it's horrible and it produces suffering and it's broken and it's not the way it was meant to be. Full stop. We want to say that we can get something good out of it. But with evil, there is no good to come out of it. Right? There is no good that will come out of George Floyd being murdered. There is no good that will come out of a wife being abused by a husband. You can imagine a wife in that situation saying, someday I just trust, God will bring some good out, I'm going to stick with this, right? It's for some good, God will bring some good out of this. No, there is no good that can come out of evil. We tell ourselves this because we want something to hold on to. But all that does is minimize or nullify evil. Moreover, when will that good come? Sure, in the future, in eternity, okay. What I'm saying is, I don't think this is how this verse was intended to be understood. Gets even worse, though. For those who love God. So if I'm suffering, am I suffering because I somehow don't love God enough? How much do you have to love God in order for something good to happen out of suffering? Okay, let's think of George Floyd. I just mentioned his name. By all accounts, he loved God. It's not for me to say how much, how little, anything. But even if we didn't know that, did his suffering end with good? Not in this life anyway. So should we look at that then and say, well, he clearly didn't love God enough? Absolutely not. That would be horrible theology. But when we look at how we typically translate and interpret this verse, that's what we have to end with. God works all things for good for those who love him, for those called according to his purpose. But what if... It's not for those. There's another way to translate this verse where it's not, we know that God works all things. I don't care about that. 
because it's still God working. God works all things for good, not for those who love him, but with those who love him. If you were to replace this word for with the word with, it's equally possible. The, this is a dative for those of you kind of grammar snobs in the room. This is a dative, and it's up to us as the translator to decide which word we're going to choose to supply for this dative. So is it on behalf of those? Is it by means of those? Is it with those? Our translations have given us the word for, and we don't think twice about it. But an equally as possible, in fact, so possible that the RSV, the Revised Standard Version, used to have or does have with. But then the new Revised, as these things happen, the new Revised Standard changed it to for. So it's, equal, it's possible enough for at one point, fairly recently, uh, for a major translation to include with. So what it would be then, and let's just click it, there we go, with those. How does it change this verse if we say, not God works all things for good, somehow getting to that point, but we know that God works all things for good with those, right? God working with those who love him. Those two things together are working the good. God works all things for good with those who love him with those called according to his purpose, because what's the purpose of our calling? To be conformed to the image of the Son. What does that mean? To be glorified. What does that mean? What does it mean? Rule. To rule on behalf of God, representing God to the world around us, interceding on behalf of the created world to God. If we were doing that in the way that Adam was meant to do that in the beginning, would we be working with God to bring good in the world. Without translating it this way, it makes very little sense, actually, in this context. So, let's go to the next slide. We put it together. We know that God works all things for good with those who love him, with those called according to his purposes. Our purpose is to do this, to work with God to bring good. For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, to be this new Adam figure, in order that he might be the firstborn among many children, right within this family of God that he's created. And those he predestined, he also called, those he called, he justified, those he justified, he glorified. We are glorified, which means that we work with God to bring good in the world. So glorification, which is to say, participating in the rule of Jesus as Lord. Which is to say, reigning as God's co-workers in his process of restoring goodness to creation. What does it mean to be glorified? It means to reign as God's co-workers in his process of restoring goodness to creation, which is what two verses previous was entirely about. The purposes for which God has called us is to bring good in the world, to work together with God to bring good in the world. And that would be the exact same thing then as the text that we saw for 2 Corinthians 6. I urge you, as God's co-workers not to receive the grace of God in vain. What would it look like to receive the grace of God in vain? In that context, it means not doing the thing that you were actually called to do, which is in that context to be ministers of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5. 